Hey, hello, howdy, how you doing? Around a year ago, I set out on a mission to cleanse Louisville of its zombie population in a series titled Liberating Louisville. Unfortunately, I failed to set up the settings correctly, causing the series to come to an abrupt end after 10 episodes. Taking the information I've learned from that series, along with some new mods that you all kindly offered up, we're diving back into the same concept, but in a new territory. Raven Creek is a modded map expansion that adds a massive fenced-in city to the southwest of Knox County. For the players who joined after Build 41, this was our Louisville before LV was added to the game. The goal here is the same, wipe out every zombie in the city in one single life. There's chaos, dumb moments, silly mistakes, fire, and of course, a ton of car crashes. You ever notice that your current web browser is taking up all of your PC's resources, causing it to move at a zombie-like pace? Some browsers use multiple gigabytes of RAM just to idle in the background. Well, what if I told you there's a way to change that? Opera's GX control feature lets you set resource caps for the amount of CPU or RAM you want your browser to use. With that active, you don't need to be like those mouth-breathing Chrome users who let their web browser limit their gaming experience. If you're more of an aesthetic person, don't worry, I got gotcha. you. With GX mods, you can overhaul the look and feel of your entire browser. I've been using the Zombie Apocalypse overhaul mod for months now, which comes with a custom wallpaper, background music, audio cues when you open and close tabs, and keyboard sounds that make it seem like you're writing in a journal. If this one doesn't tickle your pickle, I've picked out two other mods that you can try. GX Mod Zombies gives a huge nostalgia kick to any COD Zombies fans out there and comes with a light and dark theme, which is always nice. There's also one for any Plants vs Zombies fans as well that comes with all the same core features as the Zombie Apocalypse mod. As someone who used to bounce between various browsers, I'll be the first to admit that swapping between browsers sucks. That's why Opera GX has a quick import tool which allows you to transfer all of your settings, bookmarks, browsing history, and cached cookies. It's incredibly simple to use. You just go to the gear icon, scroll down to synchronization, select import bookmarks and settings, and then just select the browser that you're currently using. Whenever you're ready to ditch those losers over there and come hang out with the cool kids over at Opera, just click the link in the description or in the pinned comment to download Opera GX today. Thanks again to Opera GX for sponsoring today's video. I've been keeping my editor locked up so we can work on this uninterrupted. Flame, how are you holding up? Holding me captive at a He's fine, he meant to say he's fine. Anyway, look at this cool clicker thing. For traits, I went with my standard setup of Dexterous, Outdoorsman, Gymnast, Fast Learner, Organized, and then tacked on Stout and Athletic for my positives. For negatives, I threw on Slow Reader, Cowardly, Weak Stomach, Smoker, Prone to Illness, Conspicuous, Agoraphobic, Underweight, Slow Healer, and High Thirst. I also went with the Repairman Occupation for the two levels in Maintenance and the Boosted XP for Maintenance and Short Blunt. I spawned in in a school gymnasium. There's lockers on the east and west ends that I looted for any clothing, bags, or recipe magazines before making my way outside and killing my first zombies. Apparently, this is a part of the Raven Creek College, which I didn't even know existed, so that was really cool to see. It's a beautiful building, and I tried to check it out, but was quickly overrun and forced to retreat back into the road. I don't have a weapon yet, so combat isn't a great option. I was able to shove a few zombies over and then stomp on them, but it's really just not worth engaging with at the moment. There was this really cool moment early on while I was looting a small eatery where I was able to kite and fend off several zombies while cooking some food in a tight enclosure, all without a weapon.
With some general supplies, I set off for the eastern end of Raven Creek. There's a warehouse out there with an office building that I can hold up in. It's fenced in and hard to reach, so once the area is cleared out, it should be one of the safest locations in the city. My plan here is to let the zombies break down one of the gates so that I can loot the metal pipes to use as weapons. They're not the best weapons by any means, but something is better than nothing. Especially early on, it's not worth getting picky over. By that evening, I was able to get into the office building and to begin looting it. On the second floor, I found a big hiking bag and a crowbar. In the attic, I found a pipe wrench and another crowbar, giving me some pretty decent options for melee weapons. Heading downstairs and into the kitchen, a group of zombies broke through one of the windows, so I pressed myself against it and funneled them through one at a time, squashing them as they dolphin dived through. The next morning kicked off with some more combat while I focused on continuing to clear out the surrounding area. This included zombies both inside the factory and outside the fencing. There's a neighborhood nearby that'll be fantastic for both general supplies and weapons. We'll be able to go door to door and load up on canned goods, short blunt weapons, and even have a chance at finding a generator. That being said, I spent most of my time in these first few days trying to face the zombies head on. I brought a crowbar and a ball-peen hammer along with a metal pipe and generally favored my short blunt weapons over options like the crowbar. This was mainly due to the fact that I went in with the repairman trait which gives a bonus to short blunt XP, also allowing me to snowball that skill.
I was eventually able to deal with zombies lingering on the dead end section of the neighborhood, and with that, I was able to catch life and living. At this point, I was ready to start my looting run until I tripped an alarm, effectively reverting all of my progress. That evening, I was able to catch the 6 o'clock showing for Life and Living before spending the rest of my day pushing into the neighborhood.
the end of the day, I was able to make some pretty good progress pushing into the neighborhood. I even found a survivor home at the end of the road to the south, and when heading inside a nearby building, found both a can opener and a sewing kit, giving me a needle to party with Demi Lovato. Since it was so late, I decided to crash here for the night and head back in the morning. My goal was to make a quick pit stop back at base to drop off my loot before diving right back into a second looting run. The big issue is that I'm severely encumbered, so whenever I encounter any zombies, I've got to spam drop gear to take them on. By the time I'd killed the stragglers, it was almost 6am, so I dipped into a nearby house to watch Life and Living before heading back to base. Right now my biggest concern is just getting my weight up. If you don't know, running the underweight trait gives you a 20% damage debuff until you get your weight to above 75. This isn't a huge deal though, if we get lucky and find some butter or margarine, we can bump that up in a few days. That being said, we are currently at every male high schooler's favorite number and dropping. Because of that, I just started shoving my face with any high calorie foods I could get my hands on. Foods like dried beans have thousands of calories, but will make you depressed and make you incredibly thirsty. If I were smarter, I'd wait a few days and focus on fixing up the warehouse to make it safer while waiting for my weight to bump up. But as Alex Jones would say, I'm kinda retarded. So that afternoon, I found myself back in the neighborhood, working my way through various groups of zombies.
I actually almost died here while kiting zombies through a house. I tried to hop through a window as a zombie walked into it from the outside. Luckily, I was able to shove run past it before I could be grabbed and was able to escape back home for the night. The next day, I once again found myself in the neighborhood doing the same thing as before. By that evening, I came across a survivor home from my first day here. Since I have a hammer on me, I was able to take out the barricades on one of the windows before hopping in. Inside is a variety of guns and other weapons. This may look like a huge jackpot, and don't get me wrong, it's a great start. The big issue comes with the amount of ammo for the guns. You can give someone all the guns in the game, but if you only give them 10 shells for their shotgun, well, you're not gonna get very far. Because of this, I chose to loot the best guns with plans to revisit them at a future point. For now, my focus is solely on the melee weapons. Speaking of melee weapons, I found a ton in the cabinets, including a machete, a tin can club, and a baseball bat. After making my way back to the office building, I spent the rest of the day decorating my room with all the looted weapons I took from the survivor home. Apparently, I violated an unwritten HOA agreement because I woke up the next morning and found a few unwelcome neighbors hanging out. Later on, while exploring another block of the neighborhood that I've been ransacking, I came across yet another survivor house, which is the first time I've ever found two in the same neighborhood. After killing the zombies around it, I marked it on the map for later and set back off to find the first home. Since I'd only looted the kitchen, I wanted to explore the upstairs portion of the house along with the garage to see what I'd missed. In one of the bedrooms, I found another machete, a scrap blade, and a regular crowbar. There was a salvaged crowbar there as well, but it was in bad condition so it wasn't worth taking. In the garage, I found a blowtorch, another scrap blade, a baseball bat, and a wood axe. I also took some of the modified 2x4s for some reason, and looking back, I think I spent way too much time perusing Opera GX mods and not enough time focusing on grabbing actual usable items. With the first home officially wrapped up, I swung by the survivor home I found that morning to see what items were worth looting here as well.
While clearing the area, I also stumbled upon a zombie with a large backpack, allowing me to swap that out for my hiking bag. Inside this survivor home, I managed to find a generator magazine, some mayonnaise, and then an absolute jackpot of melee weapons. Things like baseball bats, nightsticks, a huge scrap pickaxe, and another wood axe. I also found bourbon and sleeping pills so I could impersonate Charlie Sheen that evening. There were a few zombies hanging out upstairs and even one that was glitched into some furniture, which I thought was pretty funny. That was really all that happened on the 13th though. That being said, I've spent a good three days or so in the same area. I've got food, weapons, and general supplies to last me a few weeks at this point, so I figured it was time to begin branching out. There's a self-storage up the road a bit. We should be able to find a generator up there. The only downside to that right now is that I don't have a sledgehammer with me to break down the garage doors, so we'll have to hope we just get lucky. Worst case scenario, I'm bringing one of the wood axes with so we can just smash the doors until they cave in. The walk there wasn't too bad either. I was able to level up sprinting and, after clearing a few stragglers, made it to the self-storage entrance at around 9.30 that morning. After thinking I was in the clear, I began making my way towards the first set of storage units until I was ambushed by a dozen or so zombies busting down the doors. At this point, I was already tired, so after fighting for an hour or so, I figured that it just wasn't worth it and set off back to base for the night. I woke up late the next morning to our first heli event. Because of this, I moved onto the street to try to take advantage of the situation, since it'll pull zombies that are roaming in the nearby forest, and it was a good idea to get them taken care of early on. During this first event, I managed to level up my long blunt skill, though I did lose the baseball bat in the process. I 
After making it back to the self storage that afternoon, I picked up where I left off slaughtering all the nearby zombies. With no sledgehammer to my name, I whipped out the axe and started breaking down the garage doors one at a time. Surprisingly, it only takes a few hits on each door to remove them, which was a bit of a shocker to me. For some reason, I was fully anticipating having to hit each door like 10 times. That being said, I spent the next several hours doing this, only to find empty rooms or useless gear. By nightfall, I still hadn't found a generator, though I did find an opening into one of the warehouses that was absolutely loaded with gear. I woke up the next morning to find a few zombies hanging around the base, so I got to work clearing them out, leveling up Short Blunt in the process. At this point, I'm not entirely sure where else I could find a generator if not at the military outpost. I do want to find a car before we head over there though, if nothing more than for the fact that I'm planning on looting everything in the facility. After cleaning up some of the zombies lurking around, I set out to find myself a working car. This is my biggest pet peeve with early game Zomboid, and it's 100% a me problem, but I basically spent the entire day searching for a car that either had a key or a working engine. By early afternoon, I managed to find a few cars in the neighborhood, but ran into the same issues. The good ones had no keys, so I'd need to hotwire them, and the bad ones had keys but had 20% engines. Eventually, I settled on some piece of shit car with a 40% engine and took that to a nearby fossil oil to fuel up for my trip. With the car secured, I looted the foss oil before heading back to base for the night, taking the rest of my available time to read some skill books. I set out for the military outpost early the next morning. It's also worth noting that I made the decision not to bring any guns with me since I have limited storage space in my car, so my goal is to get in and clear the entire area with hammers. If there's too many zombies, then I'll grab whichever weapon has the highest available ammo and transform it into Danny DeVito. The roads were surprisingly devoid of zombies, at least for the most part. There were a few clusters once I hit the main road, that increased as I made my way to the outpost. It was pretty clear that I was in way over my head before I even parked the car. This is by far the biggest horde that I've encountered this playthrough, and hammers just aren't going to get the job done. We'll need some firepower for this, but with that being said, I still gave it my best shot, spending the majority of the day working through dozens of zombies, breaking two of my weapons in the process, though I did level up my nimble skill, making melee slightly more bearable.
By that evening, I was tired, wet, and exhausted. At this point, I just want to head back to base, recoup and rearm, and try again tomorrow. So I did just that. The next morning, I grabbed two machetes, all 100 rounds of my 38 Special, and my s and and once again, set out for the military outpost. The biggest issue with firearms right now is that I just don't have any ammo. This was the largest amount that I had that I can be paired with a gun, so until we break in, this is what we're confined to. Since I have aiming zero, using anything other than a shotgun for the first few levels is asking for trouble, so a pistol of all things is practically worthless. But hey, at least it's not raining anymore. This played out practically the same as yesterday, but with machetes this time. Since I have no levels in Longblade, it takes me four swings to kill a zombie. The pistol takes two to three shots per zombie to kill them, and it takes close to 20 seconds to reload all six rounds, so it's effectively useless. Though I still use it to fire volleys into the crowd like any other public school kid would do. By the end of the day, I leveled up Longblade twice, aiming once, and reloading once. Oh, and I'm still sitting outside of the entrance, though there are about 50 more corpses strewn about the ground. Moving on to day three, I was starting to get a little annoyed at how difficult this was proving to be. If I'm being honest, I think it's just been a while since I've tried something like this, and I'm still getting used to that grind again, so ignore my mindless bitching and let's just get into some more combat. For weapons, I brought back both machetes, although one was practically broken. I'm running out of hammers, so I did grab a 2x4 with a blade on the end of it, along with a meat cleaver and a pickaxe that I found next to a blue truck at the base. From there, I continued to where I left off, hiding zombies around the fencing and using the chairs to rest when I became exerted.
Eventually, I was able to create a small opening, and for the first time in three days, I was finally able to set foot inside the outpost. It's much easier to kite in here since I can split the zombies up without putting myself in too much danger. Feeling a little risky, I decided to check out one of the tents since there were a few weapon lockers in them, though this one only had military clothing. That was, however, until I checked the last locker, finding a ton of magazines and a few boxes of ammo. I was able to take the only box of 12 gauge shells before narrowly escaping death while climbing through the window. While kiting zombies, I did manage to find a generator up against the western fencing, so if nothing else, at least we have that. By late afternoon, most of the zombies had split into smaller pockets, making them much easier to deal with and allowed me to get some looting in. I hit the other tent nearby and was able to walk away with two more boxes of shotgun shells and a pretty solid moss bird. The damage isn't the best, but it'll be nice to grind with and get some levels in my aiming skill before switching to the better weapons available. A little later on, I found a Remington which does have a little more damage than the Mossbergs, so I did swap to that. I'm leaving a lot of the other ammo aside from the 45 ACP and 12 gauge shells for now since there isn't a need to grab them at the moment. I still have to clear out the surrounding area and I'm really only interested in weapons that I can use immediately. That being said, we'll definitely get an armory going at some point when we have the freedom to choose, but for now, I'll stick with the shotguns. On my fourth day at the military outpost, I finally struck gold when I found one of the many armories in a tent to the northeast. There's a few dozen boxes of ammo and a ton of high condition guns. I was able to swap out my M19 for a perfect condition one and walk away with six more boxes of shotgun shells and five more boxes of ACP, along with a total of seven usable M19 mags. There's a few other tents in this section to loot, but I think I'll do the rest later. For now, I wanna focus on getting rid of the remaining zombies.
some crates i managed to find a welder's mask and a sledgehammer meaning we can just sledge holes into the fencing to navigate the outpost there's a small pathway blocked by crates that i disassembled allowing the zombies to bleed through that afternoon i found myself boxed in at the entrance to the next level of the base After taking care of that group, I was able to make my way over to the newly uncovered section of the outpost, taking some time to loot another armory tent for more ammo, before finally heading back to base for the night. We've still got a few more days to go before this outpost is secured, but progress should be much faster now that we have guns. So far, we've racked up 812 kills, with 321 of them coming from short blunt weapons, 182 coming from firearms. A crazy number when you consider the fact that we really just started using them today, with the exception to a few zombies with the SNW. Here's what my skills look like for those of you interested in that. Obviously short blunt is leading the charge, but our aiming and reloading is coming along nicely as well. Next episode, we'll look to fully secure the military outpost and then work on getting our base set up before picking out our next target. For now, the plan is to fill my car with all the junk in the lounge that I've been sleeping in and move it every time I head to the outpost to continue clearing it. Surprisingly, when I headed back to the outpost today, there were no zombies left. They must have either all moved out, or I managed to kill them all in episode 1. Regardless, I spent the rest of the day taking all of my items out of the car and tossing everything into a pile on the floor. This continued on through the next morning as well, where I was able to grab the rest of my gear and bring it over, dumping it on the floor. From there, I spent the rest of the day going tent to tent and grabbing every single weapon and bullet I could loot. I threw all of those in one of the armories in the section I was staying in. My goal here is to turn this entire section into one big outdoor armory, with each layer organized by weapon and ammo type. I found another armory in one of the bunk tents in this section, but left the guns and ammo there for now since the armory unit was practically full at this point. The southern tent also has one that I left intact for the same reason. By the afternoon on July 23rd, I'd successfully looted every armory in the base. Now it's time to actually build out the floor plan. There's a ton of military crates just lying around, so I'm going to go grab all those and organize them into columns, with each column containing one ammo type. Instead of doing this in the section I'd picked out, I chose to move it to the helipad since it had more open space. This entire process took several days from start to finish. First, we had to get enough crates to make a full row. Then, I had to move all the weapons and ammo from the main armories over to a pile where I could sort through them. After that was done, I grabbed each ammo type and sorted them into each column. 
We don't have enough containers to place each gun into, so what I'm doing is taking any of the damaged or low condition weapons, ripping all the upgrades and attachments off of them, and then throwing them in a pile so I can sell them to Somalia later on. For this, I took all the metal shelving and created a small section near the campsite. With each section of the shelving, I separated crafting items by skill type, saving one slot for tools. Well, it's taken way longer than I thought it was going to, but I think we're almost fully set up here aside from some decorations. With that, we're low on fuel, the power's almost certainly about out by this point, and I need water. There's a gas station to the south of us, and we need to get into clearing, so I grabbed a sledgehammer and began clearing a path to get vehicles into and out of the outpost. Once I had a way in and out, I grabbed a Jenny, my five empty gas cans, and hopped in the car with my sights set on the gas station. I reached it that evening and found that the power was still very much on. Pretty sweet considering we're 20 days in at this point. I was able to refuel the car and fill up all five gas cans and fill up the Jenny on this trip. I also chose to leave the generator here since I don't need it right now and the power will be going out any day, so it just makes sense. After looting the gas station and dumping toilet water into my water bottles, I set off back to camp for the night. The next morning, I went out to explore the south some more. Over the course of the morning, I found myself working through small pockets of zombies hanging around the car pileups. I managed to make it to the end of the main road at around 2.30 and even found a bridge currently under construction, or blown to bits, whatever you prefer. At this point, I began making my way back towards the outpost, but taking my time to explore some of the side roads to see if any additional zombies were hanging around there. While checking out a Spiffo's restaurant, I got incredibly lucky and managed to find a car in the parking lot with a key in the ignition. Naturally, as soon as I walked through the door, I triggered an alarm, though it didn't really bother me since I hadn't seen many zombies in the area. If you think about it, this really only helps us clear out any remaining zombies, so it's a welcome challenge. Continuing along the road, there's a self-storage that we'll have to come back to. Across the street from that is a motel that I really wanted to check out. 
On my epic quest to contract syphilis, I jumped out of the car window and shouted to pull all the hot singles in my area. After taking care of them, I went door to door looking for any items of value before crashing in one of the upstairs rooms. While heading down the road the next morning, I came across some more zombies, so I honked my horn a few times and hopped out to take them on. After fighting the undead for a few hours, I stopped by the nearby diner for breakfast, though the old heads weren't too happy about it. With the diner abandoned, I took it upon myself to cook for the community, and by that I mean I just raided the kitchen and ate all of the edible items before looting someone's car and heading back out onto the road. Heading east past the intersection, you'll run into a military checkpoint blocking a bridge. Since this is America and you can never have enough guns, I wiped out the zombies in the area and looted each of the tents. There's also a ton of medical supplies that I scooped up as well. So the bridge leads to a secluded little mini town. Because I like to make things dramatic, I think it'll be a really cool finale if we end the series with that town. So for now, it's time to change focus back to the north. While unloading my gear into its proper crates, I got hit with another heli event. Since the area is generally pretty clear, I took my time dropping most of the loot off and resting before making my way to the front gate. The timing worked out perfectly though. As I reached the outpost entrance, the zombies were hitting the car wreckage. Wielding a tactical Mossberg, I pulled the zombies into the open field and began kiting them until the heli event ended, and all the zombies were just corpses on the ground.
All right, we're nearing a month into our experience in Raven Creek, and I've been actively avoiding the main city this whole time. So today, we're gonna head into the heart of RC and get a feel for just how heavy this fight is gonna be. A little ways up the road, I noticed a fire station, so I chose to stop there and loot the area. At this point, it was raining pretty heavily and I didn't want to risk catching a cold while trying to fight, so I headed back to the outpost for the day, spending my afternoon catching up on some skill books. The storm continued into the next day, and with that, so did the reading. On the third day of constant raining, I got tired of waiting and began making my way up the road to continue mapping the area. At around 9am, I stumbled upon a VHS store, and I don't have a TV at camp right now, but that doesn't mean I can't just head back to a motel or stop in a nearby house to grab one. I originally wanted to keep the fighting to melee only, since the VHS store isn't worth starting a full-fledged battle over, though that's inevitably what ended up happening.
By early afternoon, I had cleared out the immediate area and managed to loot 13 tapes. Over the next few hours, I drove around the city trying to uncover more of the map while looking for important buildings such as bookstores. That evening, I tried my luck in a few houses, but ended up triggering an alarm. I figured it probably wasn't a good idea to stick around since I was already getting tired, so I grabbed my propane tank from a nearby grill before hopping back into the car and heading home. The next morning, I found myself back in the city looking for a bookstore. I really want Electrical 1 and Mechanics 1, but I'm also on the hunt for metalworking books. After taking a right near some shops, I got incredibly lucky again and found myself at a bookstore. This wasn't perfect, but I did manage to grab 6 or 7 magazines, along with Carpentry Volume 3 and Metalworking 1, 3, 4, and 5, along with Tailoring 2. Not all that much action happened, but rest assured, this is an anomaly. But for now, we're up to 1186 kills after 25 days, with most of our kills coming from short blunt and firearms. Skill-wise, we're making steady progress as well, which is always nice to see. I'd like to keep grinding on short blunt and aiming, but that'll all come in time. Now that we're organized and ready to go, my goal is to fully clear out both of the nearby neighborhoods. Now one of them should be fairly populated since I haven't explored it yet, but the other I'm hoping should go pretty smoothly since it's the same neighborhood from episode 1, just the opposite end of it. With that being said, this intro is long enough, let's get into things. For weapons, I'm rolling with that tactical Mossberg from last episode along with the M19 that I have a suppressor and red dot on. I also grabbed two knives for the short blades since they use the least amount of stamina. To compensate, I went with a tin can club for my heavy hitter long blunt weapon. 
I really want to focus on the closest neighborhood first for obvious reasons. When it comes to clearing out areas, it's just best to hit what's in front of you and slowly work your way up instead of bouncing all over the map, especially once you're geared up the way I am. Since we didn't have much combat in the last episode, I wanted to make it a focal point for this one. So let's get started. It's also worth noting that in between waves of zombies, I would stop to loot any electrical gear from their corpses. I still need the volume one book as well. So after I clear an area, I've been taking time to loot some of the houses to search for that. With the first block cleared out, I spent some time looting the area where I found the famed Electrical Volume 1 book. From there, I sped home, read the entire book in a night, and then proceeded to disassemble all of my electrical gear to power through the first level. Unfortunately, my diet of KFC and McDonald's caught up to me, and seemingly overnight, I woke up to find myself overweight. Luckily for us, Leaky Bum has a copy of True Grit, so after watching that, he set off on a nice 4 hour jog to burn off the excess calories. By the end of the day, I had officially stopped gaining weight, but I wasn't starting to lose any. So after setting out for one more jog that evening, I finally got the arrow to tick downwards. Now all that's left to do is wait. My weight hasn't started dropping yet, and Leaky Bum is still incredibly hungry. To be honest, I don't blame the guy since we have to pass by Jay's Chicken every day. That being said, next to Jay's Chicken is a mechanic shop, so I hit that up to grab any equipment I can use for leveling. After that, I headed across the street to another objective. For those that don't know, following this dirt path leads you to a nice secure prison. I actually base here on our Night Sprinter's wipe on the member server, and I have to say, it's easily the safest location in the map. I tried to make a more stealthy approach once I got inside, using these silenced M19 and melee weapons. The reason being, there could be a ton of hidden zombies on the upper levels, and I don't want to get ambushed while going door to door here. The garage is absolutely loaded with materials and hammers for melee weapons, which was a nice find. I kept the main doors closed for now with plans to come back and loot it at the end.
Moving into the cafeteria, all of the chairs are made with metal, which means they can be disassembled with a propane torch for metalworking XP. The plan is going to be to grind these until I can make a workbench, in which case we can start making some late game melee weapons to rock with. I don't have a key to move into the next section yet, so I just sat on the other side of this gate and winged shots of the zombies from the other side while I waited for them to break down the door. Unfortunately, they decided to break through as soon as I emptied all my mags, which forced me all the way back into the courtyard to reload. While pushing back in, I managed to scoop a key off of a corpse, giving me total access to the prison. The next step here is clearing the east wing. I have to go cell by cell since the window barriers aren't breakable. This means that zombies can just stack up on it and smack them until they either see us, hear us, or get shot by us. I also have to keep the stairs in mind behind me. You may see me retreat back near the cafeteria from time to time to reload. Every time I have to do that, it's important to run behind the stairs. That way, if zombies are coming down from the levels above, they won't be able to sneak up on me from behind. Embracing the prison life, I took the last prisoner out on the ground floor by surprise, bending him over his cabinet and stabbing him repeatedly. Before hopping in my car, I did manage to loot the garage, which contained two industrial propane tanks that'll come in handy later. I left both of those behind for now, since we'll be coming back here with the blowtorch to get some grinding in once the prison is secured. We've been rocking the M19 and the shotgun for a few days now, so I wanted to spice things up a bit. I grabbed an MP5 and slapped a red dot and a suppressor on it, along with a stock and rifle sling. From there, I grabbed about half my mags and set back out for the prison. This time around was much easier. I was able to clear out the second and third floors in a few hours, and by early afternoon, I'd fully cleared the prison. Now all that's left to do is grind out metalworking. So I went home, grabbed my gear, and began the trip back, arriving that evening. I did end up spending the night in the prison, sleeping in the lounge on the second floor, before getting back to work in the cafeteria. After leveling up again, I took all the scrap metal from the area, threw all 219 pieces of it into the van, and set off back to base. All I need to make a workbench is three metal sheets, so I got to work clearing the wreckage just outside of the outpost. With the workbench fully built, I moved all of my metalworking supplies over and then converted a ton of my ripped sheets into thread and twine so that we can start making weapons. That being said, I still need to farm out a few metalworking skills before we can get to the things worth crafting, so it's back to neighborhood clearing until I find volume 2. I'm using the same premise as before, where I walk into a neighborhood, blare the horn, and run around with a shotgun until zombies stop coming for me. After shooting up the neighborhood, I'll then go door to door, clearing out the remaining shamblers before looting places like it's 2020 all over again.
After clearing the east section of the neighborhood, I pushed north, ending up on the same street as the bookstore that I hit a few days ago. As I pulled up, I noticed some more zombies congregating nearby, so I hopped out and got to work. This ended up pulling a few dozen zombies over to me, taking most of the evening to fight through. The next morning was more of the same. My big goal for today was to fully secure that first neighborhood. That being said, progress was incredibly slow, mainly due to the fact that I was going building to building, door to door, finding maybe two to three zombies per floor. After leaving a larger complex, I walked outside to another severe storm, prompting me to head back to base and read Metalworking Volume 2. While reading in the car that evening, a second heli event triggered, though I'm not sure it had any effect since we've pushed so far north at this point. Keeping with the trend, the storm continued for several days, during which I completely disassembled the entire field of vehicles sitting outside of the outpost, tossing the metal pieces into the workbench and onto the crafting shelves. On the third day of the storm, I set out for a familiar location. Remember that self-storage building from the first episode? Well, there was that massive warehouse section that was full of crafting items that I never touched. Well, for most of these scrap weapons, we'll need cordless drills, and I figured that'd be the best place to look for them. This turns out to be a perfect plan as I walked away with almost half a dozen cordless drills and well over a dozen weapons, not including all of the welding rods and other crafting material. While leaving, I thought it'd be a good idea to stop and see just how many zombies were in the area. For the next hour or so, I tried to pull zombies out of a nearby apartment building, which almost got me killed several times. To be honest, I was completely unprepared for this. I was hungry, thirsty, and while I had weapons, I didn't have anything else in terms of survival. Eventually, I saw a small opening and took my chance, making it back to my car and driving all the way back to base for the day for some much needed Moodle management. Over the next day or two, I moved all of the material into the workbench or respective location. I also refilled some of my water bottles using ripped sheets to light the campfire.
right. At this point, I scratched the idea of cleansing the second neighborhood entirely. Instead, I had a sudden impulse to really get a feel for how occupied Raven Creek truly was. So after grabbing an M16, 10 mags, and over 500 rounds of ammo, I set off for the intersection to the north of the outpost. The biggest pain with using guns is the immense amount of time it takes to reload. With 10 magazines, it takes me almost a full in-game hour to reload all of them, all while dodging and kiting hundreds of zombies. By around 3 p.m., I'd burned through all of my 5.56 ammo and left a blood-stained road covered with hundreds of corpses. The downside? Well, there's hundreds more still walking towards me. We'll have to make plans as to how to deal with that next week, though. We're up to 2,400 kills now, with firearms making up just under 1,500 of them. Skill-wise, we've leveled up maintenance and sprinting once, metalworking three times, tailoring twice, long and short blunt once, and aiming once. We're making steady progress, but in terms of kills, I think we need to start picking up the pace. I set off early that morning, heading back to the intersection. There's a couple zombies roaming the area still, but I'll come back and clean them up later. For now, I just want to focus on wrapping up that horde from last week. A bit that I thought was pretty funny was the fact that they were all just standing in a conga line waiting for me to roll up, only coming after me once I parked the car. The fight wasn't all that difficult. I was able to split them into smaller pockets and work through them fairly easily, even using a bus stop bench to kite zombies through a window, funneling them into my club one at a time. When I finished up each section, I'd stop and rip up all the clothing for leather strips and ripped sheets before pressing on. Unfortunately, I was already getting tired by 12.30, so after moving my car up, I headed into what seemed like an old apartment complex to try and find somewhere safe to rest until tomorrow. I could have easily driven back, but where's the fun in that? The buildings seemed to be abandoned, with most of the doors broken down from zombies who'd come out to join the fight last episode. Eventually, I was able to find a room on the third or fourth floor, wash my clothing, and get some sleep. The next morning, I spent some time ripping up more clothing before setting off to finish what I started. 
Oh, I've also been disassembling watches that I find on corpses to level electrical and give me some more scrap electronics that I can use to repair generators with. With the area seemingly cleared, I took a few hours to push a little down the road in each direction, shouting to pull in any stragglers. The last thing we want is for me to get jumped from behind while I'm disassembling all of the wreckage. I'm also going to give it a few days for the corpses to dissipate so that I don't have to worry about any corpse sickness. By noon, I was completely alone, so I figured I'd better take advantage of this moment and spent most of the afternoon and early evening shredding every piece of clothing I could get my hands on. Using the crafting menu made the game incredibly choppy, so I ended up just grabbing a ton of clothing and holding it in my inventory before shredding all of it, which seemed to help a little bit. By that evening, I was starting to get corpse sickness, so I decided to call it and head back to base for a few days while I wait for the corpses to decompose, all so I can avoid getting sick every time I want to try and get anything done. I'm planning to pass the time by grinding a few skills and burning through my collection of VHS tapes hiding in a box under my bed. Over the next few days, I managed to keep myself relatively busy around the outpost. The first day was almost entirely spent reading Carpentry Volume 3 so that I could stack that with all my VHS tapes. When I wasn't reading that, I was converting ripped sheets to thread to power level tailoring. On the 20th, I read Tailoring Volume 3, and then spent the rest of the day walking around my yard pretending to be a dinosaur to level up my nimble skill like that dad from Step Brothers. The following morning, I grabbed another generator behind one of the tents, brought it back to camp, and hooked it up so that I could finally watch the complete series of Teen Titans. And no, I'm not talking about that new shitty Teen Titans Go. We're OGs here. I tried to stop the tapes after the modifiers wore off, landing me with Carpentry 6, Cooking 2, Farming almost 2, Mechanics 2, Fishing and Trapping 2. With those skills bumped, I set off for the bookstore we secured a while back to see if I could find any of those next series. I managed to walk away with about a dozen or so books, even completing a few series, though I'm still missing the last two carpentry books. In the grand scheme of things, these really don't matter all that much, but I just love grinding skills in this game, and it's a good way to kill some time while waiting for corpses to decompose. I spent the entirety of the 22nd and 23rd reading skill books. I know, shocking. Managed to cap off every book I needed to continue the tapes, again with the exception of carpentry. While I was hanging out after watching my VHS tapes, I noticed that I'd gained the desensitized trait after hitting the minimum requirement of 2500 kills. All things considered, this was pretty lucky. If you don't know how this works, there's a minimum and maximum kill threshold. I set the minimum to 2500 kills, meaning that after I reach that, a percentage roll takes place every night at midnight to determine if I obtain the trait. This percentage chance increases with each kill until I hit the maximum threshold, which I set at 5000 kills. After that, the trait is automatically given to you. This should make combat much more effective moving forward since I won't have to rely on beta blockers anymore. Not that they've been doing anything for me anyway, but you know. Alright, it's been about 4 or 5 days now, so I wanted to head back to the intersection and check on progress. Oh, it's also worth noting that I can hotwire cars now, since we hit level 2 in mechanics from watching all those VHS tapes. Well, there's still a ton of corpses here, it doesn't look like they've started fully decaying yet. On the bright side, we can use all of them to farm maggots, which can then be used as bait for fishing, which is honestly what I spent all of the morning collecting. By around 10am I'd managed to loot over 70 maggots, holding them in my pockets for safekeeping. With that out of the way, I figured now I'd give it my best shot at disassembling some of the wreckage until I got corpse sickness that afternoon.
Back at base, I managed to craft two salvage nightsticks, which converts normal nightsticks to long blade weapons. I also added screws and chains to three of my baseball bats, though it doesn't seem to matter what you add to them since the chain and screws appear to deal the same amount of damage, though they do seem to do substantially more damage than the regular baseball bats. It was around this time that I realized I'm a massive idiot. I'm fairly close to leveling up metalworking, and the base is covered in objects to disassemble, such as the 20 or so metal chairs just idling around the campfire. Getting to work on them, I was able to level up metalworking that night before heading to bed. I still need one more level before I have the ability to make scrap swords, which is what I'm really after, so I'm still going to grind that out for a bit, but we're not too far off now. My goal is to read the next metalworking book and then use some of my spare materials to build out some crates for additional storage. That way I can clean the place up some more, but still gain XP in the process. To end the day, I spent some time boiling rainwater and refilling all 20 of my water bottles. Along with the 5 canteens and 2 pots of water, I should be good for at least a few weeks. On the morning of the 28th, I set back out for the intersection to find most of the corpses now turned to skeletons. I'm in the middle of a bad storm, but I've waited long enough, so I just powered through it, stopping to rest in nearby houses or vehicles whenever I became too moist. By 11.30, I'd hit metalworking level 5 and was ready to head back. There's a truck nearby that I wanted to hotwire as well, so I filled up my current car with as much metal as it had hold, then ran over, hotwired the truck, and headed back to base for the day. The next morning, I crafted a salvaged blade, a scrap blade, and scrap sword. The salvaged blade appears to be the best, at least in terms of damage, but the scrap sword isn't too far behind it. The scrap blade is the worst of the three, but it makes sense when you consider the fact that you only need metalworking two to make it. The salvage machete looks pretty good as well, but nothing compares to the salvage cleaver. It's got max damage and is unusable when exerted, so I imagine it'll be very taxing on my stamina to use. My favorite part about all these is that you can throw them anywhere. On your back, in a sling, in your belts, or holding them. Which leads to some funny shots like this. Also, the cleaver icon is popping out of the hotbar box. Alright, enough messing around. Let's see just how effective these things are. The cleaver is actually just busted. It can one-shot zombies and has a massive range, allowing you to swing it from maybe two to three tiles away and still connect with zombies. One thing I noticed is that it doesn't exert you like a sledgehammer or a wooden axe would. Instead, I overheated myself, which was something that I typically struggle to do. This, in turn, led to me almost dying when I fled back to the truck, but couldn't get it to start at first, causing zombies to pile up on me. Next up is the Salvage Blade. It's also incredibly effective and has a much faster swing speed than the Cleaver, though the condition of it is a big problem. I killed maybe 30 zombies with it and it had already lost over a fourth of its durability. Taking into account the fact that my maintenance is level 5, I can't imagine how fast this thing would break with maintenance 1 or 2. Don't get me wrong, it's a great weapon and you'll get some use out of it, but if you're planning to run into a horde with this, make sure you have a backup for when it breaks 10 minutes in. The salvage machete was basically the same way. It feels just like a normal machete, but with half the durability. It certainly looks cooler though. When using it, you're at the mercy of landing crits. While I was testing it out, I had times where I was one-shotting multiple zombies in a row, and then I'd have to hit one three or four times before it died. It just felt a little inconsistent, but I'm also only level two long blades, so it could just be one of those things where once I hit three or four, I'll be dominating with it. Yeah. 
I finished the day with a salvage nightstick. This one has the fastest swing speed, but also the shortest range. It's got a weird animation when you're holding it, so it's a little difficult to tell exactly when to swing, but it still looks dope as shit. All in all, I really like these weapons so far, and we have a bunch more to go through. And for those of you desperately waiting for it, I accidentally flipped my truck while listening to Tokyo Drift coming home that evening. Alrighty, here comes the big stretch of combat that statistically like a third of you are just going to watch in two times speed. My plan for this is to use a shotgun since it has a larger sound radius. This will pull more zombies in, in which case I can switch to my newly crafted weapons and begin farming some zombies. Whenever I get tired, I'll rest on the benches or switch to the shotgun. I brought several stacks of vitamins to keep me going as well, so I'm hoping to just fight all day and assess the damage at the end. Throughout the fight, I managed to break the salvaged machete, salvaged nightstick, and scrap sword. I also found this nice little pavilion area with tables and chairs to rest at, so whenever I get exerted, I'd pull zombies to the north before looping around and running back to here to rest and pop vitamins.
At some point, I had found myself completely surrounded in a parking lot, so I gave up and whipped out the shotgun. Unfortunately, I was outmatched here. This wasn't a winnable fight right now. Due to some poor judgment and general cockiness, I found myself quite literally with my back against the wall, causing me to hop the fence and hope I didn't fall. The area was way too hot to even try the truck, so I just kept shooting, trying to pull zombies west of me. My plan was to kite them around the block and make it back to my car before they could reach me. I did manage to get a few good stretches in and even had a big brain play of using gated fences to slow them down while I reloaded, eventually making it back to my truck. This isn't where the story ends though. See, as I tried to maneuver the streets of Raven Creek, I found myself having to go off road to bypass an intersection under construction. Due to my expert driving skills, this led to me getting stuck on the last turn, having to temporarily abandon my vehicle and fight off the zombies continuing to chase me. The whole time, just praying that there weren't more hiding in the trees. After slashing my way through the ones around the truck, I determined the trees were not, in fact, speaking Vietnamese, and made the call to hop back in and press back to base. With today's fiasco officially concluded, this seems like a good place to stop for now. We've managed to make some pretty solid progress, unlocking access to some stronger weapon varieties. With that being said, we've got our work cut out for us. We're almost two months in at this point, and we've only killed just over 3,000 zombies. I have a pretty ballsy idea, but at this point, I'm desperate. Here's where I'm at skill-wise, and we're kind of just chugging along in combat, but my crafting skills skyrocketed from that week spent at the outpost. Today we'll be embarking on a quest that'll take us through the heart of Raven Creek to secure the hospital. For gear, I'll be taking a fully kitted FAL equipped with a suppressor, red dot, and rifle sling, along with an M19 with a suppressor and red dot. I'm fully expecting to run out of ammo on this run, so to compensate, I'm also bringing a salvaged blade, salvaged nightstick, two axes, two baseball bats modified with screws, and my salvaged cleaver. I'm not going to bank on making it there with the truck though, due to some, uh, unforeseen Paul Walker moments, the engine is hanging by a thread. This thing could love to tap a fire hydrant and be out of commission for the rest of the playthrough. Because of that, I mentally prepared myself to have to navigate through the heart of Raven Creek on foot. The drive itself was surprisingly smooth. I managed to make it through the main roads and even got pretty far to the northwest without much trouble. The big issue came when I turned on the wrong road and, while trying to correct myself, ended up sandwiched in between pieces of wreckage. I want to make this clear, the gear inside the truck is not worth dying over, but that's not going to stop me from trying. As luck would have it, we're only a block or so away from the quarantine section of the hospital. I can't get the truck through this mess though, so I went back and scooped my extra weapons, leaving them in a pile just outside of the warning signs.
One thing I did notice early on is that the tents here have armories that are absolutely loaded with weapons and ammo. I'm gonna leave them for now, but we'll be sure to loot them before heading back. Relatively early on, I found a massive US Army armory, but we'll need a sledgehammer to get in since it's fenced shut from the inside. Right to the south of that, however, there are some unfinished wall sections where zombies were beginning to flood through. I got way too cute with the combat here and ended up taking a laceration to the right forearm. This is a bigger deal than it seems because now I can't use melee. Well, I can, but the swing speed is so slow that it's just not worth it. Because of this, I had to turn to my guns as primary weapons, trying my best to stop the flood of zombies while burning through my precious ammo. They seem to be coming from the apartment building next door, and if I can quote the great band Smash Mouth, they start coming and they don't stop coming. The FAL and M19 could only do so much here. Eventually, I found myself losing ground, and slowly at first, but once all my FAL mags were empty, I ended up retreating back near the entrance, where I was able to drop the final zombies. After making sure I was safe, I shredded some clothing for ripped sheets, rebandaged my arm, and entered a small fenced enclosure where I passed out in one of the tents. Waking up the next morning, the first thing I did was check my injury. It's infected, but I'm not overly anxious, so I think I'll be alright. To double check, I disinfected it and wrapped it in a fresh bandage, then removed the bandage to reveal that the infection had gone away, meaning I'm gonna be just fine. Talk about a lucky break. A quick pan shot across the main strip of the hospital saw dozens of zombies breaking through the windows. At this point, I can't swing a weapon yet, so I fell back on my FAL to do the heavy lifting. I want to try and preserve my M19 until we get inside since I'll have to move room by room and I think a pistol is the best way to go about that. Before I even get into that though, I need to survive this wave. Alright, I'm done with 30 rounds in my FAL, so it's not going to be much use to me going forward. Because of this, I went back to my little checkpoint and swapped it out for an axe and a baseball bat. The hospital was one of the more stressful parts of this entire series. I'm not familiar with the layout of it, and I'm having to go door to door to clear out any zombies hiding behind every room. It's a very slow process, but I will say it's a ton of fun. Having found a staircase in the south wing, I spent some time burning through ammo as zombies stumbled their way towards me before reaching the main lobby. This is going to be a great spot to kite zombies in and has doorways to both south and northern wings. That being said, I didn't push into the northern wing today. There were enough zombies in the south and entrance that it kept me occupied until late afternoon when I found myself without any spare bullets. Whatever I have left in the mags is what I have for my trip, barring any that I can scrounge up from the military lockers I found so far.
Since I'm still waiting on my forearm to heal, there was no sense in continuing to push inward, so I headed back to my tent for the night, hoping that I'd be healed by morning. Unfortunately, my arm still needed some more time to heal up. To combat the infection, I sterilized a bandage and slapped it back on. The pain is gone and I can swing much faster now, which gave some optimism that I could still do some damage. Moving back into the hospital, I relied on my axe to do most of the work here. And that was until I reached the end of the northern wing. At first glance, this should be pretty easy, and honestly, it probably should have been. It was until the reinforcements showed up, bum rushing through a door like the Kool-Aid man. Admittedly, I panicked. I walked directly into the beds here, which are aligned in a maze-like setup, causing me to have to sprint directly into the zombies and hope I came out on the other side. Miraculously, I was able to stand up without getting grabbed and escape to the far side of the room, with the goal of escaping through the garage doors. For some reason, they're locked from the outside, which forced me back towards the group of zombies heading in my direction. I was able to eventually kite them around a group of beds and run back towards the way I came in, burning through half of my remaining 45 ACP ammo in the process. The group ended up pushing me all the way back to the southern wing where I used my axe to slowly cut them down. By noon, I managed to push all the way back into the quarantine room and begin looting the medical supplies stored in the nearby shelves, all while dealing with an occasional zombie. The second floor was incredibly quiet, which I guess is to be expected considering zombies have been flooding down from the north and southern staircases for two days straight. Progress was slow since I had to check each room to make sure it was empty, but by late afternoon I'd cleared the third floor, stopping at the far northern end to loot some more medical supplies, such as disinfectant, bandages, and painkillers. That evening, I found a room on the southern end of the third floor and hunkered down there for the night. This may be risky, but in my mind, it's considerably safer than sleeping in a tent out in a parking lot of one of the most densely populated regions of Raven Creek. By morning, both my arm and leg injuries were fully healed, making this the first day that I'd be at full strength since entering the quarantine zone. I thought this was fitting since I managed to reach the rooftop at around 7am that same day. Unfortunately, this was only the first building. We've still got at least one more to go. I figured the best way to go about this would be to spend some time pulling the zombies from the ground floors out into the parking lot. That way I could fight them in the open instead of in tight corridors inside of a building that I didn't know the layout of. Initially this worked, but progress again was slow. Only a couple zombies would wander out at a time, and because of this, I changed focus to looting the nearby military tents to take inventory on any available weapons and ammo. Going in stealthily may not be needed anymore. Instead, if I can pull enough ammo together, I might be able to just brute force my way through the buildings. By that evening, I'd looted well over a thousand rounds of 45 ACP ammo and a few hundred rounds of 762, which I used to reload all of my magazines. Pushing into the second building, I made my way into a parking garage. It was large enough that I felt confident in kiting zombies around, so I just started spam shouting. There's three entrances that they can come in by. One to the west, one to the east, and then the south door that I walked in through. I quickly worked out a route that allowed me to circle counterclockwise, grouping up the zombies into a ball, in which case I'd mag dump and move on.
As expected, I burned through my FAL mags pretty quickly, causing me to turn to my M19. Towards the end of the group, I decided to try and conserve some ammo, so I swapped over to my salvage blade and took out the remaining zombies before resting outside. The second floor is much more convoluted than the previous building. There's several corridors that you can go down, and the whole time there's an unknown amount of zombies banging on all the doors. That afternoon, when making my way down a flight of stairs, I stumbled upon a room with barred windows. This looks into the parking garage, so around 60 or so zombies had grouped up here and began aggroing the window. The problem is that they can't break through, so they all just got stuck here, leading to me dropping almost 100 rounds into them to put them out of their misery. The elevated floors were much easier to deal with. For the most part, it was really just zombies stuck on doors so I could walk up, slap them with my salvage nightstick, and move on to the next without worry. After spending the night in a room on the fourth floor, I wrapped up the second building and headed back to the garage where I cleared out the east wing, looting a small armory along the way. With two buildings down, we've got one more to go. Unfortunately, the entire ground floor is sealed shut and I didn't bring a sledgehammer. This calls for drastic measures. With the building up in flames, there's nothing left to do but wait it out. Having successfully accomplished my mission, I threw what I could into the bed of the truck and began making my way back home. Eventually, I came upon a parked truck in fantastic condition, so I moved all of my loot over to that and siphoned fuel from the white truck to get it started. With the hospital officially liberated, we're up to 4150 kills, with firearms far and away leading the charge. Skill-wise, everything is progressing smoothly still. Having Nimble 3 is a huge boost for melee skills, and we're about to hit level 6 in aiming, which should be fun. Today, we'll be committing felony stages of arson, or in other words, peacefully protesting in the streets of Raven Creek. To accomplish this, I'm planning to use a combination of noisemakers and the truck siren to pull zombies into the apartment complexes before yeeting several Molotovs into the middle of them. I figured this is one of the most efficient ways to make some pretty astounding progress, so I'm just gonna let it fly and see what happens. In the likely scenario that I need to abandon the car, I've equipped several weapons including an MP5, a tactical shotgun, an M19, and my salvaged cleaver. I figure this way I have a weapon for every situation. To start, I'll need one more level in electrical to hit electrical 3, which is needed to make noisemakers. I figured I'd start off by going door to door in one of the neighborhoods, disassembling all of the TVs and any other items I could get my hands on. I tried to grab a variety of melee weapons since this gave me a chance to burn through some of my arsenal. Of course, almost immediately after pulling zombies, I got hit with the old animation inertia, causing me to run directly into the zombies instead of turning around. If you're new to Zomboid or just don't know, there's an issue where if you're trying to 180 into the opposite direction, your character can bug while jogging and just continue to go straight, regardless of what buttons you press. It's particularly frustrating because it's not even like a skill issue that I can focus on and improve, it's literally just a bug that will never get fixed, and it's been in the game for over two years now. Alright, mini rant over, back to stabbing and slashing.
By the end of the day, I'd only managed to gain around half a level into Electrical 3. When I got back to base, I tried to power level by fixing up the generator, but it was at 95% condition, so I only gained 7 XP from it. If you wanted to see some actual progress with this, uh, while perusing the neighborhood for TVs the next day, I accidentally triggered a house alarm, which brought in a whopping two zombies. It's crazy how far we've come. Eventually, I had a grand realization that half of these tents in the outpost have computers or radios in them for me to disassemble, so I just farmed those until I hit level 3, finally allowing me to craft noisemakers. Now all we need to do is wait for it to stop raining. Alright, let's do this. The plan is pretty simple. I'm going to drive down the main street at a whopping 5 miles per hour. This should pull any stragglers that have wandered over, along with any zombies in the houses that I've missed so far. It's going to be a boring drive, but it'll be worth it when we finally jump ship here. After finding myself in the middle of some wreckage, I started dropping noisemakers until enough zombies had piled up, in which case I lobbed out three molotovs and got to work kiting. The big predicament I ran into right off the bat was the fact that I was encumbered because I was way too greedy with my weaponry and didn't take into account the extra weight from any of the noisemakers or molotovs. That being said, it's still just kiting zombies at the end of the day. Everything was going smoothly at first, until my game crashed while walking back towards the truck. This is where that infamous tweet and screenshot on the community post came from, I don't know, a month or so ago? For some reason, when I loaded back in, all the zombies in my cell were unloaded. It's also worth noting that the time reset to this morning for some reason, but I'm not sure why. For reference, the game made two files. One is the crashed version, and the other is the current file that I'm playing on. Gotta love when Project Zomboid takes the Todd Howard approach. All of this just works. It's not, I'm not kidding. With that being said, I did try to repeat the process, spending several more hours grouping up well over 100 zombies before trying to throw a Molotov that somehow missed every single one. After another hour or so of driving around, I gave it another shot and was able to catch a few zombies along with a stray house in the process. Now that we've got a start, we can jump out of the car and pull all of the zombies next to the siren. Quick tip here, zombies are weird. If they see you get out of the truck with an active siren, they'll aggro you. But if you simply place a noisemaker on the ground, they'll drop aggro on you and get stuck bouncing back and forth between the noisemaker and the fire truck siren, allowing me to walk away and take refuge in another building. While looting a nearby house, I managed to scoop another bottle of bourbon, converting it into a Molotov so that I could use it later on. At this point, the zombies are starting to die, so I began moving them into different cells to continue to pull zombies in. With the day coming to a close, we've managed to kill around 450 zombies with fire so far, but we can do way better than that, so I began moving north. Eventually, I reached the tunnel barrier at the far northern end of the city and decided this would be a great place to try and crash the game again. After grouping a few hundred zombies, I lobbed my last Molotov and began kiting them into one giant ball. From there, I began pulling them into some of the larger buildings in the game. This one was pretty risky, but you gotta take ballsy chances when you're doing dumb shit like this. Luckily, I got away with this without shoving glass through my arm and was able to shove run through the zombies waiting at the window. This continued for a few hours with me looping around to various buildings and dropping noisemakers just inside of them. At this point I was incredibly tired so I whipped out my vitamins and started shoveling them into my mouth. 
With the Flintstone gummies working overtime, I swapped from the MP5 to the shotgun since it's got a much larger sound radius than a suppressed SMG. This whole kiting mission continues through the night, so editor man's flame, please for the love of god pump up the lighting so people can see. Unfortunately for me, there's no towers in Raven Creek, otherwise this series would end today. Instead, we have to go the route of hoping we can just burn down the city like that scene from Spongebob. Believe it or not, a city's still a city, even when it's missing half of its buildings. Just ask Kenosha. By morning, I was out of Flintstone gummies and it was starting to get foggy, so I decided to head back to the outpost for the day to rest and re-gear. The only problem? I completely forgot where I parked my truck, causing me to head back on foot. If that wasn't bad enough, I also triggered another heli event, which, I mean the fact that this couldn't come yesterday and needed to wait until I was out of Molotovs is one of the biggest middle fingers I've ever gotten thrown at my face. I also realized that I left my M19 and around 400 rounds of ammo in the truck, which sounds like a lot until you realize I have 28 extra boxes, so I think I'll be fine. Alrighty, since I'm out of bourbon, I figured why not dump out some empty wine bottles and use my excessive gasoline supply. That way, I can continue my fireball escapade without having to hit up Pitbull for any supplies. With six more Molotovs and a considerable amount of coffee, I set back out into the city to finish what I started. A lot of this gets very repetitive very quickly, so here's some highlights of the day. I spent most of my time hanging out at these larger apartment buildings and the subdivisions around them. My primary method was to funnel zombies into a tight line and then kill the first few so that all the zombies wandering behind them would have to walk through the fire, spreading it to hundreds as well as all the buildings that they were next to. After finding hundreds of zombies trapped in a police station, I did the only thing I could think of and burned the entire building to the ground. At this point, I didn't want to waste any of my coffee, so I found a nice fenced-in parking lot that I could camp out in and spent the night there. Alrighty, after burning through most of Raven Creek, I've been able to log over 4,600 fire kills and tacked on a few more firearm kills, effectively doubling our total count. Well, I wanted to use a new gun, so I grabbed an M77, slapped a 4 to 12 times variable scope on it with a rifle sling and bipod. I also grabbed an MP5 for emergencies before crafting one scrap blade and three scrap swords. I still have no idea where my truck is, but I have the van still, so I hopped into that and set off for the bridge. There's still quite a few pockets of zombies roaming the area, but I'm not really concerned with them at the moment. That'll be where we spend all of next week dealing with. For now, I want to reenact Pearl Harbor. There was a small group waiting for me at the bridge, so I figured I could get some usage out of my scrap weapons early on and got to work.
After killing 20 or so zombies, I approach the bridge, only to realize that I need a sledgehammer to even set foot inside the fencing. Guess I'll be going home tonight after all. The next morning, I woke up to a thunderstorm, which is just lovely. The game's also starting to feel incredibly unstable at this point. In some sections, I'm only averaging around 25 frames, when I can usually get up to around 200 on a normal playthrough. I think a lot of this is just the modded map, and then spawning a ton of zombies into an area that's been terraformed into a city. We've already had one crash though, so adding something like a thunderstorm into the mix only made me more anxious. Getting back to the bridge, I used a sledgehammer to break down the initial fencing in order to move my car through, before using my MP5 to clear out the zombies waiting on the other side. From there, I swapped to the M77 to clear out the bridge. With the 12x scope, I can hit zombies at the end of my pan range, which was really nice, but the damage output is terrible. Oftentimes, it took 2 to 3 bullets to kill a single zombie. Because of this, progress was slow, though it did make me feel like Chris Kyle, so I just went with it. By early afternoon, I reached the end of the bridge, where I found a few sledgehammers in the crates, allowing me to continue breaking through without having to run all the way back to grab my old sledge. Just down the road a ways is a mall that looks like a prison. It's sealed shut, so I used a sledge to break down a one-tile passage and entered into the courtyard. It's super risky to go into tight quarters and try to clear this out right now, so instead, I pulled out the M77 and caught the attention of every zombie in the mall, with some quite literally throwing themselves off the rooftop for a chance at me. By nightfall, I was out of 9mm ammo and had defaulted back to the M77, which made progress once again incredibly slow. I was able to escape the horde by looping them along the perimeter and sneaking out through the hole I created. There's some cars in the parking lot, so I chose one with four doors to sleep in since I could bounce back and forth between the seats if I was ever attacked during the night. The following morning, I left my MP5 in the car since I have no need for it, and walked my way back to the mall to pick up where I left off. I also felt like the black cowboy hat wasn't cutting it anymore, so I swapped back to the brown one for now. It became evident early on that I was going to need some serious firepower if I wanted to make a dent here, so after an hour or so of fighting, I chose to retreat back to the bridge where I hopped in my car and drove all the way back to the outpost. So at this point, it's no secret that the M77 was pretty terrible. 
The big downside with that is I still have almost 300 bullets with along 20 extra boxes of 308 rounds. Initially, I assumed those were lost and that I just have extra junk lying around, but I learned that you can convert these into 7.62 rounds that I can use in my M60, so I spent the rest of the day converting rounds. When paired with my 20 boxes of existing 7.62 ammo, it left me with just over 1,000 rounds of ammunition, just asking to be used. I have 12 M60 magazines, so I grabbed 11 of those and loaded them up with every bullet I had. This way, I don't need to spend several in-game hours reloading, I can just mag dump and move on to the next one. The one major downside with this, however, is that the M60 and the magazines are incredibly heavy, so I'll need to shed gear before heading back to the mall. Even after dropping all of my spare tools and two scrap swords, I was still encumbered. Though, the best way to fix this is to simply start burning through ammo, and I'm sure at least some of you have been waiting over a month now to see the M60 in action, so let's get to that. After pulling a Princess Diana, I had to walk the rest of the way on foot, which actually wasn't all that bad, but it made me nervous that I'd become exerted as soon as all this popped off. This thing melts. This is what 150-ish rounds looks like. I did have a f up towards the end of the day that almost ended the run though, when I found out the hard way that you can't shove zombies while holding the M60. Luckily, it was just a scratch on the right hand and it should be healed before I need to use it. I ended up sleeping in the same car before finally pushing into the mall the next morning. I was able to exploit the single entrance by funneling the zombies at me while melting them with the M60. I use this to fully wipe the zombies idling in the courtyard before finally pushing into the building. There's a small bakery area with some food, so I was finally able to eat while pushing back an onslaught of zombies who were literally falling from the sky.
Now at this point, I would started going room by room to clear out the main building. There's some really cool designs that I'll try and showcase as we go through here as well. At around 12.30, I walked into one of the guard towers and triggered an alarm, but it didn't pull any zombies over. Moving back through the building one more time, I killed a few more zombies before heading outside to spend the next 6 hours or so collecting leather and ripped sheets, all while continuing to push back the Viet Cong charging out of the trees. Taking a quick break from combat, I spent the entirety of the 21st converting all of my ripped sheets into thread to level tailoring. When I wasn't doing that, I converted my 5 looted boxes of 308 into 762, giving me an extra mag to use when I pushed into the docks. I spent most of today on the outskirts trying to secure the area. There's a gas station here for some reason, so I looted that before finding an abandoned building. For some reason, most of the zombies were congregated here, which made it relatively easy for me. The docks were shockingly quiet. A few small pockets here and there, but I'm pretty sure I used less than 200 rounds to clear the entire area. Eventually, I found the boat and found some stairs to get me near it, but was too scared to try and jump onto it, since I wasn't sure if I'd be able to get out or not. So this is what it looks like. I spent the next few hours going through the docks, pulling any remaining zombies I could find, but at this point, I think we're in the clear. We're up over 10,000 kills at this point, which is insane, going off of the M77 and M60 kills, we dropped well over 1,100 zombies over here. Not including the MP5 or the scrap weapons, which is nuts to me. Skill-wise, we're progressing, which is always nice to see as well. Originally, I was going to end here and save episode 8 for heading back through the rest of Raven Creek, but I feel like this is a really short episode, so I decided to slap 7 and 8 together and spend the rest of this video hitting up the major districts of Raven Creek and finishing off the remaining pockets before the grand finale. Oh, I also spent like three days at the outpost just grinding tailoring and finally upgraded my backpack because I remembered I could do that. Along with upgrading the backpack, I added leather strips to make some extra protection for my gear before setting off. Especially since I'm planning to use melee weapons because I've got just this massive supply that I want to burn through. At this point, I wanted to reflect a little on the series and talk about the ups and downs so that hopefully some of you who are going to try this can learn from my mistakes. For starters, I completely recognized that finding two survivor houses in the same neighborhood was the catalyst to the entire series. Because of those houses, I was able to push into the military outpost and come up with enough gear to really do anything I wanted. 
If I hadn't found them, there would without a doubt have been way more melee combat and I would have spent much more time pushing into the city compared to how I just walked in with an M16 and a thousand rounds and just started shredding. This has been a really refreshing playthrough as well, but it's also one that started to drag about 5 episodes in. Especially because during all of this, I've been doing world record attempt streams on 16 Zombie Pop, so going from that back to this made the game feel very empty in comparison. That being said, having taken everything I learned from liberating Louisville and applying it to Raven Creek was incredibly rewarding. Especially because it actually felt like I was making progress and you could visibly see it happening. It wasn't like an LV where I'd spend three days clearing a road, only to leave for one day and have it be completely overrun due to zombie migration by the time I came back. I can't tell you how disheartening it was to kill 1500 zombies with spears, only to have the road look like I never touched it the very next day. Going from that to Raven Creek, where I could spend three to four days pushing through a neighborhood and then being able to revisit it a month later in game and only seeing a handful of zombies was so satisfying and gave me a real sense of accomplishment. One thing I'd do differently though is actually go cell by cell in a grid and work my way through, instead of going to specific pockets of the city and fighting that way. This would have been a much better way to track progress instead of having to quite literally burn down the entire city in order to see what was left. Another big bonus for this playthrough was using the Ducks Zombie Building Spawn Fix, which spawned zombies in their building without me having to have a clear line of sight into each one. This made the larger buildings like the hospital much easier to work with. Instead of having to literally check each door to spawn zombies, I could just shoot a gun or set off a noisemaker and had the knowledge that any zombies that could have respawned were already there waiting for me. The only real complaint I had with this entire playthrough was just how unstable it became in the latter half of this series. I did have the big crash during episode 6, but in general, I've had to restart my game several times per recording session. I could start at 240 frames, but after about 30 minutes of playing, I'd be down to around 20. I had this similar issue in Liberating Louisville, but that was mainly due to the blood textures. I'm sure they played a role in the performance issues here as well, but to be honest, I think the biggest portion just came from the fact that this is a modded map and we're around 3 months into the playthrough at this point. There's so much additional map data that the game has to track. Add in thousands of zombies, some mods, and a ton of blood overlapping on every surface. Oh, and also the fact that we literally added a mod to tweak zombie spawns, forcing the game to spawn in zombies that it otherwise would wait to do. This is all just me trying to say, I get it. This was just an inconvenience to power through, and it definitely took a little of the enjoyment away every time I'd try to take on a group of zombies and my frames just shit the bed. Alright, I've been quote unquote reflecting for almost a full page of the script now, and I think that's good enough. At this point, we're up to 11,213 kills and counting, with my most used weapon being the Mossberg Tactical Shotgun. Here's one more skill update since the last one was several in-game days ago, and things have slightly changed since then. There's only one place left to liberate, and it's just over this bridge. I wanted to do something cool for the finale here, so I figured why not dress up like a juggernaut and just walk through my enemies. So I made a full set of scrap armor here to slap on before we waltz in. I brought along an M16 with all my remaining 5.56 ammo, as well as an M19 with around 400 bullets. For melee weapons, I made three machetes and brought some additional gear like an axe, a baseball bat, and some short blunt weapons. I also snagged my cleaver just in case I had to smash down any doors. The initial push here reminded me a ton of when I first went into the military outpost, but this time instead of kiting around with a hammer, I was rocking a fully kitted M16. Something I didn't expect to happen, however, was that I'd burn through almost all of my 5.56 ammo right away.
By noon, hundreds of corpses littered the streets, and I had found myself down to just 25 bullets. I still have my M19, but I truly was not expecting to be without my M16 so early on in the battle. At this point, I swapped to the M19 and began repeating the process, though this round was much easier. Obviously, since we already dealt with the brunt of the remaining zombies at the entrance, we're really just cleaning up the scraps as they stumble out of nearby shops and houses. My scrap armor saved my life here when a zombie snuck up on me as I was reloading. This shredded my pauldrons in one hit, which was kind of a shock. At this point, it was starting to get dark out though, and I didn't want to risk fighting in the night, so I moved into a nearby apartment building and found a room to spend the night in. The next morning, it was back to basics. I raided the gas station to stock up on some junk food like I was about to pull off the sickest land party of all time, before proceeding to absolutely decimate the remaining citizens of Raven Creek. By 9.30, I was completely out of ammo, meaning it's time to get up close and personal. Equipped with a metal shield and a salvaged machete, I continued my rampage through the streets. After clearing out the main shopping district, I pushed east until I hit water. This is more of a residential area, and I haven't been this far in yet, so I managed to bundle a few groups together before heading back to the car to finally use my big surprise. I honestly didn't expect that to go as well as it did. With a two dozen burning zombies following me, I tried to capitalize on it by leading them through the residential district like I was leading the world's shittiest protest. 
While marching, I kept spamming Q to pull in any nearby pockets of zombies so that they could be added to the collection. This went on for most of the day, with me kiting various groups of zombies into a giant ball and then marching them through a ton of houses until I'd quite literally burned through the majority of the zombies in the area. Now there's two bridges leading out of here, both leading to separate locations. We'll start at the northern bridge. There was a group of about a dozen zombies waiting for me, which I took care of with a fire axe. There's a few houses over here, but this section was a dud. Most of the zombies were in that initial pack on the bridge, so aside from one or two loitering around, there was nothing here for me. The southern bridge had the same setup, with the majority of the zombies waiting for me on it. Heading across, there's a massive building of some sort just idling over here. I'm not entirely sure what it is at first glance, and to be honest, I don't really care. I just want to wrap this up, which means it's time for a fire montage. After a few moments of waiting around, it became obvious that the building wasn't going to burn without some intervention. After spreading the fire into the front room, I focused on killing zombies next to the building walls so that they'd also catch on fire. After a few hours of repeating this process, I made a second attempt to push the fire further into the building. This time though, I led all the zombies following me in, blocking my only known exit. Pushing into the back hallways, I managed to dodge some of the flames before finally catching fire. Normally this would be a death sentence, but I had two canteens on me which I used to extinguish the fire. I was left with a burnt right arm and very severe damage, but I was still alive. The next morning, I made my way through the charred insides of the facility, killing all of the remaining zombies, before doing a loop and taking out the final zombies in Raven Creek. The drive back to base was somber. I was expecting some grand feeling of accomplishment, and it really didn't hit me at first. I dropped my armor and said one last goodbye to the outpost that housed me for the last three months. I decided to walk through the map one last time, reminiscing of some of the battles I'd fought here. The roads were empty, and it culminated really well with the background noise of the wind howling through the city. It gave me a big I Am Legend vibe. It was really cool to revisit some of these places though, like where the game crashed and I thought my playthrough was going to end, or where I burnt down over a thousand zombies with one Molotov. It's moments like that that really made this playthrough what it was, an overall incredibly enjoyable experience, at least for me. It's crazy to think that three months ago we started out in a school with nothing and ended up where we are now. There's nothing left to do now but escape. It's time to see what lies beyond the gates. 
Thank you all so much for watching. This series took several months to record with original production starting back in May, if you can believe that. I want to give a massive thank you to Little Flame who helped with a ton of the editing in this project, as well as Fragskin who created all of those incredible thumbnails that you clicked on. This series would not have been possible without them. I have both of their channels listed in the description down below, so go check them out and I promise you won't regret it. Along with them, I want to extend my sincerest gratitude to my YouTube members and Patreon supporters who allow me to live my childhood dream of being a YouTuber, as silly as that sounds. I appreciate you all. And as always, thanks for stopping by.